listening to Radio Owl's Nest. The songs of Martin Page, all day, all night, forever. So grab a cup of tea, settle down with us in the Owl's Nest. Grab a cup of tea, two bottles of whiskey, a lot of marijuana, and maybe a shot of heroin, and you might get through this. I'm not sure. Oh, can you believe it? Can I think you can, because if you're tuning in, you know that we've done quite a few shows here. We're right up to 45. <laughs> And I was only going to do half a show or one. We're up to forty-five, which is a thrill to me because I, do, you know, I don't stay consistent too, too, too long, and uh, I've stayed qu- quite consistent on these monthly shows and specials. So I'm rather proud. And if you're one of the uh, owl heads that has been there from the beginning, well, I'm sure you are on heroin, marijuana, uh, all kinds of. <laughs> heavy drinks um and you're you're actually going to aa at this moment listening to the show because uh, you've been really 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 good and really bad by listening to these shows but thank you if you've done that and you've survived um i feel like starting the show off with something quite bright nifty and uh, a pleasant and quite vibey song I, I wrote a song in the 90s um the naughty 90s with a great singer and a great writer called Steve Balsamo. We're still in touch. He uh, looks at my Instagram and I look at him. Uh, his Instagram. I don't look at him. I look at his Instagram. I mean, for goodness sake. But uh, he had a fantastic career and still has a fantastic career. Great, great, great singer. Uh, a Welsh singer. We won't hold that against him. We can't. We shouldn't. I like the Welsh. Uh, he's best known for playing... Um, the lead role in the London production of Jesus Christ Superstar uh, in the mid 1990s. So I think I met him at the late 1990s because I think he'd already done that. He's about to have a solo career. But we got together, we got on, and we wrote this song together called "I Want to Be the One." And we were going to do another song, um, if I can remember rightly. We didn't. I played him a rough, and he said, "Yeah, let's do that." It was called "One World," but we didn't get time because he had to clear back to the Welsh mountains or something. Um, and also, I. I had a song called Samsara. I should play that to you someday. And he showed a lot of interest in, in that as well. But Steve uh, was great to work with. Lovely bloke. I mean, really, really... And a great singer. Uh, still doing it. You should check out his websites. He's in a band that is his own band, which he's doing some great stuff. He never stops. I mean, and he looks younger and younger and younger, which scares me, because when he came to me, he looked five years old, and now he looks three years old. It's frightening! Frightening! Anyway, let's stop rumbling, and let's play you this demo from the late 90s i believe with steve balsamo i think i'm saying it right steve balsam balsamo balsamo let's have a look at this let's, let's have a look how you, balsamo i'm sure it's that if steve will forgive me anyway it's called i want to be the one <laughs> Baby, 
reaching to your eyes I want to be the one to lift you to the sky I want to be the one to make love so high it never dies so baby like a spam sperm call it's a sperm call i have to go to a sperm bank it's a spam call my god we get so many of those sperm spam calls don't we um <laughs> steve balsamo i'm sure i'm saying the name right uh, great to write with him a song called i want to be the one I enjoyed that session when we did that and i just felt like playing that today from the late 90s i believe go and check steve's website out his instagram and the bands he's in and the and the solo albums he's made he's made as many solo albums as me we're in a race but he's five years old so i think he's going to beat me anyway that's a, a demo and this whole show i haven't brought that up ever i'm sure um, i should this is a songwriter's podcast called radio house nest i don't know why i said radio house nest because i loved radio luxembourg when i was a boy growing up and i thought a podcast should still be called radio something i learned yesterday that radio luxembourg the actual offices of radio luxembourg they were a gestapo setup yes it was where the gestapo had these buildings and they used to um do terrible things and uh, thank god radio luxembourg got hold of that place where the gestapo were the bastards and turned it into something beautiful and musical and used to inspire us kids in england because we'd hear those songs coming across the water late at night and not the gestapo bombers thank god in the blitz but just great music from the 70s onwards uh, that was uh, very special to me you'd lie on your bed late at night coming home from school and turn your little transistor radio on and you thought you were in um, a magic land that only you knew about radio luxembourg this is radio owl's nest and that my friends is the creaking door and if you've been with me for 45 months you poor sods you know that that means we're going really into the vault into the archives where it's dusty dirty and tarantulas live and uh, we are going to play a very um unheard demo i always say the word rare and i'm trying to find another word for rare um special that's because all martin page's songs are special um anyway we're going to play a demo that hasn't been 
eared before, heard before. Ooh, this is fun. Fun for me. Uh, about, I don't know, ten years ago, I think, uh, when I was uh, writing songs uh, for and with uh, Robbie uh, Williams. Uh, I'd met him playing soccer up in Mulholland Drive, where he used to live, in one of his huge mansions with a football field. And he said to me, as we were playing soccer, um, I want to do a folk album. And I thought, really? Really? Are you sure? <laughs> And he said, yes, get your acoustic guitar and start writing. And he was off to, I think, London to do a Take That uh, tour. And um, I, um, he kept on sending me emails saying, how are you doing? How are you doing with it? We're going to call this Gypsy Songs. The album's going to be called Gypsy Songs. I went, OK. And um, I wrote about 15 tracks, all very rough, I could, because he, you know, he said, just do them real rough and uh, get them into a spirit. And this is what I always do, uh, phonetic vocals. I just find sounds. Sounds are really important to me, more than the lyrics at first. And sometimes I find a title. And on this track, um, I called Fake it um i don't know why that appeared but it did and it had a kind of real elvis presley and ancient feel about it like it had come from the south and i really dug it when i was doing it i did it's really rough i'm going to play this to you in a raw state i'm playing a little bit of about th two acoustic guitars and a little bit of bottleneck and it's all just making up the melody as you go and then there's a chorus with fake it and robbie heard it and said this is brilliant i can see the potential in this this is definitely going on gypsy songs um well obviously down the line he stayed with take that for 35 years and never came back um but <laughs> <laughs> he did another solo record and stayed all in, I think, in Europe for a long time. I was still writing these songs. And in fact, uh, he did come back for a short period and I came to his house and played him the tracks and he played them to his manager and said, this is what I want to do. And I'm sure his manager said, um, we're going to shoot you if you do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there never was uh, a Robbie Williams gypsy songs at this point um, folk album and when I say folk I was really trying to wonder what he meant by that because he'd heard some of the tracks on one of my albums um, Temper of the Temper of Peace a Temper of Peace where I did a lot of acoustic songs and was getting uh, very interested in acoustic uh, music uh, folk music the real the real stuff and so a lot of the songs I was writing had a kind of Donovan and uh, slightly Americana um, um, slightly Gaelic kind of feel about them and I just went with it and there were some really good songs there so I I've dug my hand in the tarantulas have bit me but I don't care I'm gonna pull this cassette out well it wasn't a cassette was it no it was on digital pro tools really rough and ready but I'm gonna play this to you because I'm del enjoying hearing this again it's a song um, an idea called fake it <laughs> Oh 
inside your life Hear his whispers in life And pray that you hear Will burn the cradle Every word came to life And a little one I bleed The rain will fill it so Where's Elvis when you need him? <laughs> I got off on that. I must admit, I did get off on that. Um, the, that's a, that, all these little lyrics are clues. And I heard that, come and lay down by your lyre. Uh, uh, and let's fake it one more time. And I just thought, mm, there's something in that, isn't there? Well, yeah, I can see two people getting together and say, let's fake it one more time. Lay down there, baby. Um, yeah, well... <laughs> I'm having fun on my own. It's crazy. Uh, that's a demo that um, the tarantulas can't kill me, and I've pulled it out of the vault. It's called uh, Fake It, and I wrote it w- uh, in mind for Robbie Williams uh, with about 15 other, well, about four, yeah, 15, 16 other songs I knocked together real quick. You can hear the old bottleneck, which I'm not very good at playing, rattling against the uh, acoustic uh, guitar. But I've been studying around that period, funny enough, a lot of the, the beginning of the blues and the big, and the, the real authentic folk that was coming uh, around in the early years, which I had knew nothing about in England or America. So um, it was great fun to knock these songs together, so roughly as well, because... Um, as my manager said, you know, don't send Robbie to, uh, um, uh, too too detailed a demo. Yeah, and I remember when I was working with Robbie that he really enjoyed it when it was rough and ready, and then you had a lot of places to go. So um, there you go. I'm faking it there with fake it. <laughs> No, the 80s weren't fake, were they? Were they? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> could be. Uh, that's what I had a lot of success, so maybe it was fake. Um, but maybe that's a desire for hearing a song from the 80s. Yes, that's a lot of enthusiasm. That crowd there, they, 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 they know what they want. And so I am going to play a demo from the 80s. Um, a song called All For Love from that very famous movie that everybody seems to love called Say Anything from 1989. Um, I wrote a song called All For Love and Nancy Wilson recorded it. And I've got the demo here, so maybe I should play it. You probably know that movie from the iconic scene with Peter Gabriel holding the boom box up and playing his song In Your Eyes, John Cusack. It wasn't Peter Gabriel holding the boombox, it was John Cusack, up to his girlfriend-to-be, up in a window somewhere. Um, the album did really quite well. Um, I think it went gold, I'm not totally sure, but the film slowly grew. It was... It was um, Cameron Crowe. Yes, he always used to do these movies with these great songs. And Well, I've got the demo here, um, and I remastered it, so it's uh, quite cool to put it through some mastering stuff and to bring it back to fresh life. This is Tommy Funderburg singing the, de- the demo. I wrote it with John Bettis, a very famous lyricist who wrote uh, songs with the Carpenters, etc. Very, very, very famous lyricist. I was very lucky at that period because I was writing with Bernie Taupin, uh, Hal David, and here we were with John Bettis. A lot of lyricists were um, coming to me for some bizarre reason in the 80s. I, w- I didn't complain because a lot of these songs uh, did quite well. And uh, the demo was done in my um, house here, where I still am. Yes, I've stayed in this house for many years. And I just moved in, so my 16-track studio <clears throat> was in the living room, right next to the fire- fireplace. And I can remember it was one, it was one, probably the second demo I did in this house. And to me, as a songwriter, it was very important that every time I moved a studio that I got a cut or a hit in a different house. It was like, I suppose, lovers, when they marry and they go into a house, they say, we've got to make love! in every room well to me as a songwriter 
<laughs> what a bizarre thought. Um, as a songwriter, I thought, I hope I can ha- write songs that are hits in different rooms. And so far, I've achieved that. Uh, it's like every studio has to get a cut. And I remember that I wrote Witches Get Burnt with Bernie Taupin, the first song for a movie in this house. And still by the fireplace in the living room before I'd moved the studio into the garage. Garage. Garage, as the English say. Um, I re- uh, we, we wrote this song and we recorded it there. And... Uh, Tommy Funderburg came across and did a really great vocal. He sang it once, and he well, and we started the compet, and he said, "I think I can do it better." So he did do it better. And uh, John Bettis w- wrote the lyrics to the melody I was uh, creating. It's me doing all the screams around Tommy. These uh, these melodies that were appearing, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yes, it was a period of Gabriel yelling. Um, But let me play you the original demo that Nancy Wilson uh, took and put. It was track one, actually, the main track on the Say Anything uh, album. I think there's a video on YouTube and all that stuff. But I'll shut up now and play the remastered original demo of... What's the song called again? Yes, there it is. All for Love.
Yes, I was screaming at the top of my voice. <laughs> there I am again. Um, it's funny, when I came into LA, you know, we were, I was doing all those stuff for Kim Carnes on the first uh, single she did of our songs, uh, Invisible Hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, you're right, you're right. That was in the 80s as well. And I seemed to have all these Gabriel screams going on, and I was hired for that for a while, like the Banshee from London. Well, from Southampton. But I... Uh, <laughs> There, that, where there was that banshee scream again on that song, All For Love. Um, I remember taking this song into the record company and, and to the soundtrack people and I, uh, with John Bettis. And I think he was a little bit nervous about it because I don't think he was thrilled with the title of All For Love. And I, um, and I don't think it was his, his type of song, but we went uh, with it into this office, played the track, and these businessmen, about four of them, just sat there. Just like that. Yeah, nothing happened. They just looked at us. And I said, play it again, louder. And they did. And the second time they, it went through, and I was doing all these movements with, ah! Yeah, I was, I was screaming away there. Um, again, at the end of the song, this time they went, yeah, nothing at all. <laughs> so I thought we lost it. And then one of them piped up and said, this is bloody effing brilliant. And uh, there it was. <laughs> it became, everybody breathe. Ah. <sighs> And the track went on the album. I do remember that I thought Richie Zito's version of it with Nancy Wilson, uh, the lady who sang These Dreams from Heart, wasn't as good or as spirited as the demo. Um, it was neater and you, everything was right. And my demo here, not everything's right about it, but I still felt like it missed a an emotional punch that we needed. Um, anyway, we'll move on from the... <laughs> you lot ah, the 80s it's still in my blood and uh, <laughs> I must admit I've got to play you something it, this is a pseudo band of mine yes it's me uh, and all of you know that called Zeke Monroe and the Flashheads some reason a few years ago I thought ah, wouldn't it be good to be like David Bowie and do that Ziggy Stardust shit um, and uh, I did it I, did, I made an album well I'm not quite finished then I thought well that's pretty crazy for a man who's 122 years old but I went forward this is a track that really does sound like Germany and Kraftwerk and uh, the beginning of the 80s I think and I think I'm going to play it to you even though it's not finished again it's phonetic vocals me making it up as I go along but the bass and the feel uh, it did remind me of what we were doing when we were doing Q feel and uh, when you fall in love or you get attached to somebody you do get absorbed don't you this track is called Absorption No, 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 no,
bit of a 12 inch isn't it yes it went on and on i was thinking 12 inch in those days when we used to uh, go to the clubs we used to hear these remixes of these kinds of songs and uh that's unfinished i gotta put on some really good guitars and uh, play with the lyrics um but it did remind me that in those 80s we were um extremely experimental and european um a 12 inch yes <laughs> 
a 12 inch was a 12 inch vinyl i should tell you what a 12 inch is because probably uh i'm talking about prehistoric times it sounds like a porno movie doesn't it 12 inches yes a good porno movie there um a single i'm talking about a vinyl record that is 12 inches in diameter um and we used to go to the clubs and listen to these remixes and they were um better grooves on a 12 inch so you got all the bass there you could you could master it better oh my goodness oh my goodness still in the 80s this is my demo of yes in the 80s a song you know we built this city say you don't know me i recognize my face say you don't care who goes to that kind of place lady deep in the hoopla sinking in the fight We Built This City, um, the first version before it went on to be uh, touched up for the Starship record. Um, my goodness, hearing that again, um, I realised that at that period, um, I was making, I was playing without um, sequencers or um, computers, and so everything was played live. 
and everything had to be tight and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later because I was reading a book about Steely Dan and um, I thought I was tight and methodical on how uh, music had to be recorded but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Steely Dan later on it made me realize that um, in all my early years in the late 70s and the 80s as a songwriter and as a musician all we really cared about was being tight and I mean tight by being playing really in time and getting everything right I was a bass player so in those days of the 70s in a live band the bass player had to really link with the drummer and it was really important that the rhythm section between the bass and the drummer was tight meant that uh, everything was really felt but also extremely in time and listening back to we built the city the demo there um i'm, I'm quite amazed because i'm playing all these synthesizer parts live and these days everything is sequenced on pro tools and everything is really really sequenced where it seems that human beings do want to be robots i've always thought that we are going towards being robots um but it did remind me that what was um, what came out of the 80s were these drum machines and the first first start really of computerization and digital recording. And for us English guys that came to America, it was really important that everything was in sync and everything was tight. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that later on um, because. Uh, reading this book about Steely Dan, I thought I was the god of tightness, and I was told that by Maurice White of Earth, Wind & Fire. He said, I've never met anybody as tight and as precision-oriented as you. I don't know if that meant it was good or bad, but I, I, he'd worked with David Foster, and I thought that was precision. And I said, well, David Foster, I mean, he must have been really, really over the top about it. And he said, no, yes, he was. He said, yes, he was, but you are still <laughs> immensely tight, tight about tight, tight. being in time and in tune and precision. Um, I've loosened off over the years, as you probably noticed, but at that time, late 70s and 80s, when drum machines and precision of programming started to appear, I was extremely English and wanted everything to be right. right, 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 right. But what is right? Yes, what is right? Uh, we listen to bands like Little Feet and Weather Report and Earth, Wind and & Fire, and uh, we go like, what is right, tightness or feel? And over the years, I think uh, a mixture of both is perfect. Feel, though. I think feel wins the day. Here's a song I wrote a few years ago and haven't finished. I went into the vault, the tarantulas backed off, and I found this demo that I haven't finished called The Sun. There's a moment in each of our lives When our conscience cannot hide When we must open our hearts And give what shines inside For all of those suffering and the cold Your faith light up the dark And what shines in every heart Pass it on The healing of the sun
the sun The greatest gift we give someone Is just being there You've got a friend It's not the end We can't start over again Pass it on Ooh. Open the clouds Let your faith light up the dark And what shines in every heart Pass it on The healing of the sun Your face up to the sky Open the clouds Let your faith light up the dark What shines in every heart Pass it on Let your face feel the sun. Um, a demo, I absolutely, I've said this a few times when I discover these things, I had no idea I'd written a few years ago. Um, it's a guide vocal, trying to learn about this song. A um, few lyrics there, though. I can see where I was going. Pass it on, the healing of the sun. We can start over again. So um, maybe I should finish that um, and... Uh, do it right as we just said before i like things right so i need to finish it and get it right of course pagey calm down calm down but that's um i get the word rare i shouldn't that's a um unusual track from me <laughs> i still haven't found the word for for rare have i but that's a, a demo from a few years ago that had gone totally out of my thick skull called the sun now we were discussing um, precision and tightness <clears throat> in recording albums and, and songs and singles and all that stuff um, and I think it really relates to that period when you are actually um, making music uh, what time you're doing it what era what decade because technology really influences um, how musicians make their songs and, of course, I sort of came into the, uh, thank you, Mr. Owl Head playing the piano there behind me. Very, very effective there. Very exciting. Um, I came to the prominence in the early 80s as a songwriter and uh, in my band, q Phil. And when I wrote those songs, we built the city in these dreams, etc. And it was drum machines and sequencers uh, coming into the forefront of um, music, popular music at that time. MIDI, where all the, it's called MIDI, where all the keyboards could link play together in time. It became an infatuation with the industry. You just got to think about those early 80s and uh, Trevor Horn, you know, and all his work as a producer. I mean, the Buggles and everything he did. Frankie Goes to Hollywood and all those productions, even I think in the later years, into the next decade, it was very, very very programmed, very, very tight. And some people didn't like it. I remember that Elton John was going to be produced by uh, Trevor Horn. And he said, no, it's just not got enough feel for me. It's just too glossy and too tight. But really, that was, I can only say this again and again, at the beginning of the 80s, when I was here in America, uh, the use of Fairlight synthesizers, 
and claviers and, and drum machines. Well, the person who understood how to do that, it was big news. And I came through as a bass player in the, in the late 70s, and you had to be tight in your own way as a live player. As I said before, you have to be really tight with the, with the drummer. You think of bands like uh, Average White Band and, and uh, all the funk bands and Stevie Wonder and everything and Funkadelic and Parliament and Bootsy and uh, Brothers Johnson. We used to always really look at the rhythm sections and how tight they were as a skeleton for those songs being recorded. And uh, eventually when the 80s came about, it came down to maybe just two people uh, making a record like Soft Cell or something. You had your drum machine, so you had your drummer. You didn't have to pay the drummer lots of money and you didn't have to think, oh, he's moving out of time. Let's keep everything mechanical and mathematical <laughs> and in time. Um, and it's an interesting thing because I was reading Steely Dan, this book called Major Dudes. And of course, this is a retro show. Steely Dan were one of the most influential bands to me as a musician growing up. And they were known for being extremely tight in the studio. They had There was a mythology about it, really. Um, Border Becker and Donald Fagan. They used to bring all these different musicians and spend years, years uh, getting these live musicians to play um, with a certain feel. I think some of those records, Asia and The Royal Scam uh, are, and Gaucho are pretty phenomenal because you've got live players playing um, extremely tight but with feel. But I, when I was reading this book I realised that Donald Fagan etc in Steely Dan could have been even worse than me about being tight. And I'm going to read you uh, a little bit here from this book called Major Dudes, edited by Barney Hoskins. Um, let me see, I've built, I guess I've... <laughs> Let's just read this. This is when they're doing gaucho, okay? And they'd be, all the years before that, they'd been using live musicians, but they were thinking, we need, we want it even tighter! My God. Yeah, so here we go. Using one of the first programmable drum machines, the Lin 9000, together with a computerized drum sequencer called Wendell, which was made by their engineer, they set about building their tracks from the drums up, sometimes replacing each synthetic beat with a real one played by a live drummer, a process that took hours. Instruments would be added, often to be later erased or edited. Months could be spent working on the same track. While Becker and Fagan were notorious perfectionists, minutely attentive to the tiniest blemishes, Fagan was probably the most neurotic. His drive to eliminate anomalies and drive to eliminate and square off every detail leading to legendary feats of fussiness and the nickname Mother. He was, he was nicknamed Mother. While recording Home at Last on Asia, he reportedly spent four days punching in the words, well, <laughs> the, yeah, two words, well, the, four days punching in two words, well, the, as in, well, the danger on the rocks is surely past. That's as bad as me. During mixing on Gaucho at Village Recorders in LA, I've, I've worked there many times, great studio, Fagan encountered his ideal, one of Neve's earliest automated desks, which allowed incremental tweaking of infinitesimal details. After the 250th mix of Babylon Sisters, the maintenance crew <laughs> awarded him a platinum floppy disk hand-painted with silver nail polish. When engineer Elliot Shiner reached mix 274, Fagan decided an acceptable compromise had been reached and took it home to New York to listen to. A week later, everyone was back in the studio to mix the second bass note in the second bar, which Mother, being Fagan, had noticed was a touch too soft. Uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> I really can, because I've been working on, al on an album for, uh, yes, nearly four to five years with live players. Um, you can get uh, really into it. Um, but I must say, uh, if you listen to Steely Dan's records, uh, you do, if you're, t if you're a musician specifically, you will start to realise that they were pretty amazing at uh, getting real feel uh, with a luxurious touch.
tightness, but it can become an obsession. But I have to reiterate there that the 80s, uh, when technology exploded, and as I said before, I think technology and music uh, makes these happen. We follow it as musicians. But today, today, with Pro Tools and Doors Digital Workstations, we do hear these records that are inclined to be with auto-tune on the voice. Yes, we still want to be robots. We're heading to being robots. It's extremely tight and to me extremely cold and to me extremely mechanical and you do lose emotion even though i was using drum machines and uh, all the synthesizers and uh, sequences i was always looking for emotion i think peter gabriel is a great example of how to do it right well there ends your lesson your of being tight <laughs> and i don't mean scottish tight where you don't you know, want to pay for any drinks and you bum cigarettes, fags off of people. You, no, 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 no. I don't mean that kind of tight. I mean precision tight in music. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because you listen to f um, folk music, often played live, and you listen to classical music and how tempos change and, and musicians f play off of each other. I think really ultimately when you achieve that, you've got it right. right, 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 right. Well, I'd like to play you now a track that led off my Poetry of Collisions Volume 2 album. Uh, that was an album of 30 songs, triple album of the demos that I play on this radio show, this podcast. A song called Wonderful World. Really an ecology song, but it feels good. Drum machines and live playing, emotion with feel. We may take for granted the trees that kiss the sky. We may forget why the birds they fly But lay down your head on the green grass Feel the earth beneath your hands And let your soul cherish this place that is yours Oh, my God. 
think I wrote that um, in the 90s and um, lovely to put on this Poetry of Collisions Volume 2 album uh, with 30 songs, triple. I just like it. I'm so pleased to put a triple album out. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever achieve that in my life, but it's all the demos. And that means there was a Poetry Collisions Volume 1. I think there was 22 songs on that, or something like that, or 20. So that's like 50 demos released. Can't be bad. Can't be bad. Pretty proud of that. Well, I'm glancing up here uh, at Pro Tools at the time here. Yes, it's the the door, the digital workstation we still have to go through, even if we use live musicians. We're in the digital age, aren't we? Uh, I, think, I think that caused a lot of problems, to tell you the truth. Good some ways, but awful in other ways. It's 61 minutes and 22 seconds and 4,220 is a lot, a lot so <laughs> I was never good at maths uh, we're at the end of the show okay I'll be there in a minute <laughs> I've had great fun you can tell, I can be on my own in a small room and still get off uh, it's very weird, um, but this that's not working yeah, okay, hit it properly this signifies, it's that moment that moment you've all been waiting for when I give you quote of the month. And the quote comes from Oscar Wilde. Again, I think I've quoted from him before, reading a wonderful book called A Life of Oscar Wilde by Matthew Sturgis. Pick it up. So here is Oscar's quote. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. How true. Um, I've had great fun. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you, Owlheads, uh, for being out there listening to this. Me, I think, yes, show 45. My God. And we are still uh, moving on. Um, it, stay fit. Stay healthy. Look after yourself. Stay positive. Look on the bright side of life if you can. It's not easy sometimes. And as I always do at the end of a show, um, I talk about the innocent animals and how we should look after them. Animals are not ours to experiment on. Animals are not ours to eat. Animals are not ours to wear. Animals are not ours to use for entertainment. In the owl's nest. Animals are not ours to abuse in any way. Animal rights, fight for them. Okay, guys, see you soon. Pagey. <laughs>